a little more than a year ago for another friend of ours, a marvelous guy named Ray Boguslav, <coughs> and one of the people at the service read this poem, and I, I thought of it when, uh, when I knew we were all going to be here, because <coughs> it's an unlikely thing as relates to Jim Bennett, and yet at the same time, few of us would argue, but what the dead center bullseye of Jim's life was music. And this is, a, this is a poem about a bunch of fellows sitting around a fire made out of driftwood. And it occurred to me that the, the, the flames and the smoke and the fire itself, which my boys call caveman TV, you sit in front of an open fire and you look at it and you go into it. That's a lot the way it feels when you are playing music. And it turns out that playing music and listening to music, however intricately and intimately they are related, consist of two slightly different things. And when you're playing the music, you're communicating with it and with the audience in a different way than they're communicating with you. And I like the metaphor of the fire for the music, and I like the idea of these fellas and girls in a quiet place, probably not unlike some of the best pubs we've been in. Jerry? <coughs> Yeah. This is by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He's one of those guys that used rhymes when he made poems. <laughs> Robert Frost. Robert Frost was once asked what he thought about free verse. And he said, free verse is like playing tennis with the net down. <laughs> we sat within the farmhouse old whose windows, looking over the bay, gave to the sea breeze damp and cold an easy entrance night and day. <clears throat> Not far away we saw the port strange, old-fashioned, silent town. <clears throat> the lighthouse, the dismantled fort, the wooden houses, quaint and brown. <clears throat> we sat and talked until the night descending filled the little room. Our faces faded from the sight. Our voices only broke the gloom. We spake of many a vanished scene, of what we once had thought and said, of what had been and what might have been, and who was changed and who was dead. And all that fills the hearts of friends when first they feel the secret pain, that lives, thence, lives thenceforth have separate ends and never can be won again. The first slight swerving of the heart that words are powerless to express and leave it till still unsaid in part or say it in too great excess. The very tones in which we spoke had something strange I could but mark. The leaves of memory seemed to make a mournful rustling in the dark. Oft died the words upon our lips as suddenly from in the fire, built of the wreck of stranded ships, the flames would leap and then expire. And as their splendor flashed and failed, we thought of wrecks upon the main, of ships dismasted that we hailed and sent no answer back again. The windows rattling in their frames, the ocean <coughs> roaring up the beach, the gusty blast, the bickering flames all mingled vaguely in our speech until they made themselves a part of fancies floating through the brain, the long lost ventures of the heart that sent no answers back again. O oh, flames that glowed, O oh, hearts that yearned, they were indeed too much akin, the driftwood fire without that burned, the thoughts that burned and glowed within. Mm -hmm. Mr. Longfellow, who knew how to do it. Mm -hmm.